Hello everyone and welcome to this third event in our Art in Action webinar series in which we explore the intersections of literature, authorship, political activism and celebrity culture across historical periods, literatures and societies. My name is Sandra Meyer, I'm a research fellow in English literature at the University of Vienna and the Oxford Centre for Life Writing and together with my comrade in arms Ruth Scobie who's lecturer in English at Mansfield College Oxford, I'm one of the conveners of this series which we had originally intended to be a two-day international conference at the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities but which sadly had to be cancelled due to Covid. Now it's thanks to the generosity and also the enthusiasm of our wonderful speakers and our conference partners at Torch that we've been able to bring Art in Action back to life and to enable discussions that we think couldn't be more timely and couldn't be more relevant. Discussions that centre on the social role and function of literature and the cultural authority of the writer. Now we started off our series two weeks ago with the launch and discussion of Asha Rogers' brilliant book, State Sponsored Literature, and we continued last week with an excellent panel on writers as political activists with contributions by Simon Morgan, Divya A and Odile Hainders, which took us from early 19th century England all the way to contemporary Tamil Nadu and the contemporary Western public sphere. Now, those of you who were unable to join us live for these fantastic events will now have a chance to catch up on them through our Torch website and also the Torch YouTube channel, where recordings of those two webinars are now available for you to access online. And uh, as you can see, the links have just come through the chat here. And thanks to our two wonderful speakers today and their willingness to share their thoughts and insights with a wider public, we're also in a position to record today's event and to eventually make it available for you to watch on uh, our various websites. Now today's webinar in fact will be one of the highlights marking week 17 of Torch Goes Digital, which is the center's response to current global developments in the shape of a wonderful selection of new and curated content, podcasts and live online events on themes as varied as AI, performance, environmental humanities or language and translation. Now this week's programme, quite auspiciously, is dedicated to the theme of activism and we couldn't be more delighted to be hosting an event that is bound to be one of its highlights, an event that will once more draw our attention to the interface between the politically active writer and the larger structural frameworks in which they are situated and positioned. Institutions, networks, platforms, artist collectives, as well as literary salons. Now, we are very lucky to have two fantastic speakers here with us today, Ellen Wiles and Benedict Schofield, who will explore those intersections, both from a localized and a transnational perspective. But before it's my pleasure to introduce Ellen and Ben, let me just say a few words about the format of the event that we're going to be following today. So we'll hear the two papers in succession with Ellen starting off and then kind of seamlessly handing over to Ben. We will then kind of enter a more informal conversation about some of the central concerns that have come up in both Ellen and Ben's presentations. And we'll then open up our discussion to include audience questions and we would ask you if you could please make use of the Zoom Q&A feature, which is quite conspicuously positioned in the bottom row of your Zoom screens. Now that's all in terms of housekeeping for now. So without any further ado, let me introduce our first speaker today. It's an enormous pleasure for me to have Ellen Wiles here with us. And Ellen's really one of those impressive people where you look at their CVs and it really makes you think, how many different lives can you possibly fit in one? Now she's lecturer in creative writing at Exeter University, but she's also a novelist, an anthropologist and a former human rights lawyer. After reading music at Oxford, she gained master's degrees in human rights law and creative writing. And she also practiced as a barrister at a London chamber for several years and was also active in several international legal consultancy roles. Now, her experience on some of these projects led to her first books, Saffron Shadows and Salvage Scripts, Literary Life in Myanmar Under Censorship and in Transition, published in 2015 with Columbia University Press. 
She's also, as I said before, a published novelist. The Invisible Crowd, which explores asylum and immigration in the UK, came out in 2017. It's her first novel and she's currently working on her second. Now her talk for us today on literary performance as activism at the Polari Salon draws on her ethnographic research for her forthcoming book, which is entitled Live Literature, the Experience and Cultural Value of Literary Performance Events from Salons to Festivals, which will be coming out later this year with Palgrave and is yet another exciting publication for us to look forward to. Then I could not be more delighted to have uh, Benedict Schofield here with us today and our paths have been crossing again and again over the years. Ben is reader in German and co-director of the Center for Modern Literature and Culture at King's College London. And his research focuses on German studies, transnational studies and comparative cultural studies with central concerns, including the representation of German speaking countries and Germanness in cultural texts across world literary systems. He's also working on German theater and performance, in particular, the German engagement with Shakespeare, which as we all know is a huge topic. And he's also interested in, and this is something that we share in 19th century cultural studies with a specific focus on constructions of authorship. And this is a topic that we both had a chance to explore as part of some of the excellent events organized by the Authors and the World Project at the University of Lancaster a few years ago. Now, Bain's publications include the monograph Private Lives and Collective Destinies, Class, Nation and the Folk in the works of Gustav Freitag, and the co-edited volumes, the German bestseller in the late 19th century, German in the World and Transnational German Studies, which I believe is coming out very soon or is already out. I believe there's a book launch coming up at the end of the month. Um, so yet another wonderful and exciting publication to look out for. And this transnational perspective that you're exploring in this edited volume is of course also one that will be brought to the fore in your talk for us today on the literary political networks that frame and sustain contemporary performances of engaged authorship. But that's enough from me now. I'm sure you can't wait to actually hear from Ellen and Ben. I'd just like to say that we're absolutely thrilled to have you both with us today. And a huge thank you to both of you for taking the time for joining us here today. And uh, I shall now leave the floor to Ellen. Thank you so much, Sandra. Uh, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining today. I'm really delighted to be part of this series and I'd just like to congratulate Sandra and Ruth for reimagining it and bringing it online with such a plum. Um, so to start off with, I am just going to share with you um, a cover slide. All right, so uh, I am going to talk to you today about the Polari Literary Salon and about how literary performance can function as a form of political activism. So Polari is an LGBTQ plus salon based in London's South Bank Centre and it's also toured around the UK. And I started going to Polari back in 2014 as part of a wider live literature research project that, as Sandra mentioned, will manifest as a book later this year. I first became drawn to researching the subject um, back in uh, 2013 when it struck me how central live literature events, um, especially literary festivals, have become to 21st century literary culture and yet how little research had been published about them, um, particularly events featuring fiction. So part of the reason for this is clearly the way in which the field of Western literary studies has historically been focused on text rather than on orality. But over the last few years, there has been a surge of interest in literary festivals. This has been mostly from publishing study scholars and most of their research has had a sociological orientation. So it tends to be focused on festivals, structural relationship with the publishing industry. And this reflects how literary events tend to be viewed by publishers too. They are seen as useful vehicles for book sales and publicity, but often not much more. But what I observed once I began regularly attending events for my research and also since 2017 performing at some of them as, as an author of fiction is that there was a lot more to them than that. Reader audiences certainly didn't see themselves as participating in book marketing exercises but as participating in meaningful event experiences. So I decided to focus my live literature research on participant experience and the idea of cultural value. 
Now experience is an incredibly multifaceted and complex thing. A whole raft of neuroscience over the last few years has given us new insights about how powerful embodied audience experience in a shared physical space can be. So I wanted to find a way to research participant experience at an event like Polari that took into account its multifaceted quality, including its aesthetic and emotional elements. So I devised an approach that I call experiential literary ethnography. It derives from a long literary anthropological tradition pioneered by Zora Neale Hurston as far back as the, the 1930s. In a nutshell, experiential literary ethnography is a narrative that's crafted to evoke participant experience through creative writing techniques while also examining that experience. So reading one should make you feel a bit like the writer who brought you along to an event with them so that you two are immersed in it as a co-participant. So each of my ethnographies weaves together separate sensory descriptions with ex extracts from conversations with participants, including reader audiences and author performers, as well as some extracts of text performed, descriptions of how those texts are delivered and wider lens reflections and analyses. So overall, I found that the experience of live literature events can have multiple, sometimes profound effects on reader audiences, including on their interpretations of texts and their sense of what it means to be part of literary culture today and even the cultural value of fiction. I've also found that the experience of live literature affects author performers in various ways, including in terms of their relationships with their own texts as well as their readers, and it sometimes really shapes the way they see their identity and role as authors. So in a nutshell, live literature has a deeper cultural impact and value than is often assumed. So as well as taking this slightly different ethnographic approach, I also decided to extend the scope of my inquiry beyond festivals to look at smaller literary events like salons. And I found that the experience of participating in these more niche and intimate events like Polari, which I'll be talking about today, can have a profound impact, sometimes more so, and often a very different type of impact to the experience of participating in the bigger festivals like Hay, for instance. So many of you might associate the phrase literary salon with the phenomenon that reached its peak in 18th century London and Paris and was thought to have died out um, in the 19th century. But Polari is an example of the literary salon making a contemporary comeback. So towards the dub of my talk today, what is distinctive about Polari among salons and how does it function as a form of political activism? So let me give you a quick taster of my ethnography of Polari before I draw out some of my insights. I'll just start at the beginning and then I'll hop across a few different bits. Behind a low stage, illuminated in flamingo pink, still empty but for podium at the centre, ceiling high windows display a spectacular backdrop of the Millennium Wheel. It's glowing emerald, though as I watch it shifts to orange like a giant traffic light in reverse. Behind the wheel is a sparkling black ribbon, the Thames underlining the Houses of Parliament. The view could almost be computer generated, but this is really what London looks like from the fifth floor function room at the South Bank Centre. Screens on either side of the stage show a real computer generated image of the same Millennium Wheel backdrop, but with a larger than life man lounging in the foreground, sporting a top hat garnished with a feather and a sparkly tie reminiscent of Willy Wonka. He's holding a paperback, which he's regarding with gleeful shock, half looking at the camera. Several other books float and flit around him like butterflies and sparkles of magic dust. A full house of about 150 people has gathered here on this chilly January evening to a soundtrack of feel-good funk and the chatter is noisy and ebullient. Some are queuing for drinks at the little bar exclaiming at how good it is to see each other. Some hugging, jostling, joking, chatting. The majority seem to know several others and act like regulars. Seats are quickly filling up. I'd say there was a mix of men and women here ranging in age from 20s to 60s. The music volume ramps up, prompting applause, as the man from the screens takes to the stage in the flesh, wearing a flamboyant combination of white sunglasses, a silver top hat, a candy floss jacket and a boldly patterned tie. Welcome, he grins. I'm Paul Burston and I'm your host for this evening. Now, are there any Polari virgins in the house? A scattering of hands cautiously ascends as members of the audience come out as Polari virgins. I estimate about a third. Burston regards them for a moment before slyly reassuring them, we'll try to be gentle with you. So skipping on a bit, Polari is the name of a coded language that was taken up by the gay community in London when homosexuality was illegal as a means of disguising their activities. And it became a core part of the burgeoning gay scene after World War II. And interestingly, from a live literature perspective, the word Polari derives from the Italian parlare, to talk. So it was always intended to be spoken, not written. And it can be traced way back to the 16th century when it was used among traveling circuses and then 
spread as sailor slang. Paul Burston started Polari back in 2007 as a pop-up in a Soho gay bar, and his idea was born out of frustration. By that point, he had published three novels, but he hadn't once received an invitation to read at a literary event. And other gay author friends of his complained of the same sense of exclusion. The sandal took off, and then two years later, Polari was headhunted by the South Bank Centre. Now, Polari contrasts in many ways to the elite character of the historic salons. It's much more democratic for a start, so tickets are publicly available for just a fiver at South Bank. It also has a distinctive aesthetic and atmosphere among live literature events. So Burston has described it quite neatly as a literary showcase with a cabaret feel. In my ethnography, I describe a handful of Polari performances. I'll just outline a few of you, these for you now. So one of them is a performance by a trans woman writer of an extract from her romantic novel about a woman coming out as a lesbian and falling in love with her cousin. Another is a performance by a white male novelist who also runs a publishing company called Team Angelica, which aims to celebrate queer writing and has a mission to represent the underrepresented and to encourage diverse voices, especially voices that are gay, queer, black and of colour, and to put out work that celebrates diversity in the maverick spirit. And he reads part of his novel about a former Liberian child soldier in the UK exploring a new trans identity. A third is a performance by a writer who's much more well-known in the publishing mainstream, Stella Duffy. And in one Polari event, she performs a short story that had been broadcast on Radio 4 and is set in a tunnel under the Thames. And later she performs a literary memoir piece published in Granta magazine, which confronts the sexual abuse that she was subjected to as a child. Now, a key feature of Polari, unlike many other literary events, especially festivals, is that it does not involve a discussion with the chair after a reading or a Q&A session with the reader audience. Each author performer introduces themselves, then chooses some of their prose to perform, and they have about 15 minutes for this, which is a much longer reading slot than at most literary events. The ethnography relates a number of my conversations at Polari. So one member of the reader audience I spoke to was a woman from South London. She comes to every Polari event, primarily for the literature, she says, but also obviously because it's gay and lesbian and for the social side around that. And she talks about how right, the writing at Polari usually touches on gay and lesbian issues. And even if that's sometimes quite indirect, as she puts it, that's fine with her. Really, it's just interesting to hear whatever the story might be about from a lesbian or gay perspective, she says. The quality of writing at Polari is often pretty mixed in her opinion, but again, that's not a problem. She likes its range and diversity, and she likes how the event provides a platform for underrepresented writers who identify as LGBTQ+, as well as more established writers. A lesbian couple at the Salon together, also regulars, told me about how a lot of the performances at Polari are funny, but many are deeply moving, and they like the fact the whole event revolves around performances from the books and that there's no Q&A. One of them says, with the gay community and how we can be treated, there's something about that shared experience of rejection and prejudice. When someone comes up and speaks to that from their writing, it really resonates throughout the whole room and you really feel like a community together understanding that. Her partner agrees and says, compared to other queer arts events, Polari is special. There's something about this setting, the fact that it's live and there's an interval where people chat and we get to know one another. There is a real sense of community here. There's also something immediate about a live literary, like literary reading that's not present in other places, she feels. And Polari's relaxed atmosphere contributes to that. When authors are reading, she says, it's less of a formal performance here. It's almost like it's their turn to speak in a conversation or something. It's so much closer. Perhaps inevitably, not every Polari participant feels the same about the Salon as a community. So one author performer who identifies as a lesbian told me she was glad to have been invited to Polari for the first time and enjoyed it. But she felt she didn't really fit in. The aesthetic was too camp to represent her and she felt it was still at heart an event organised for gay men. And this rang true to me. The origins of Polari and the Soho gay, part, gay bar are still manifest in its tone and aesthetic. But my conversations with participants revealed that the majority of lesbian participants, certainly in the reader audience, didn't feel uncomfortable or excluded. Paul Burston told me that he didn't want to include Q&As, partly because he usually found them boring, uh, but also because he wanted Polari to be more of a showcase for writers. But importantly, his programming isn't just focused on entertainment, it emphasises literary variety and form, tone, style, voice and aesthetics, as well as content. So, Texts include public fiction, work in progress, stories, poetry, memoir, nonfiction, 
and they range from observational comedy about awkward sexual situations to moving confessional memoirs about the discovery or exploration of gender identity. And Burson always takes care to include both novice and experienced writers and also writers who identify as LGBTQ plus in a variety of ways and writers who identify as straight but whose work engages with the LGBTQ plus spectrum of experience. So Burston has a mission for Polari that goes beyond the literary to champion diverse LGBTQ plus social spaces. And the salon does attract a pretty diverse crowd, certainly in terms of age, gender and class in comparison to many other literary events that I've seen, although a bit less so in terms of race and ethnicity. Most reader audience members I spoke to told me they came for the writing and the community aspect pretty equally. The writing was centrally important to most of them, but many of them would not define themselves as particularly literary. Several said that they viewed literary festivals, in contrast to Polari, as spaces where literariness was expected and performed, along with other manifestations of white and middle class heterosexual social conformity. So in contrast to the big literary festivals, Polari is definitively not focused on providing a stage for the top writers according to mainstream literary culture. It is clearly understood by all participants that it, for, it functions partly as a platform for emerging writers who wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to perform and that they both need and deserve support. The creative impact upon all the performers of witnessing their peers perform Polari is not only bottom up for the benefit of the novices, the impact goes both ways. So one Polari headliner admitted to me that he was once so inspired by a new emerging writer he saw at the salon that he wrote a new text in a similarly experimental form to perform a, a later edition. And the salon affects reader audiences reading practices beyond the event. So many told me that they bought books by the author performers that they'd witnessed at Polari and most said that the performances led them to read more and different books than they would otherwise have done. And the performances have set, affected their silent reading experiences too. So most people in the audience um, felt that having heard the author performers read aloud caused them to hear the voice of that author in their head while silently reading later. And those people often said they valued a sense of authenticity during the performances, which somehow resided in the quality of the voice and in the space, and they held on to that later as they read. And the memory of that performance experience also affected interpretations of the text notably in understanding some elements of the humour in the text, but also how they found meaning in the text in relation to ideas about LGBTQ plus identity. So in contrast to other forms of performance, the act of performing fictional texts at an embodied live event like Polari enables the communication of rich experiences, emotions and perspectives through character and through narrative. And so it allows an infinite variety of LGBTQ plus identities to be shared and explored in really nuanced, complex and multifaceted ways, in contrast to more reductive representations that are quite common elsewhere in culture. And crucially, being able to perform their literary text without ensuing Q&A or discussion means that any author performer at Polari is not then compelled to articulate or represent a defined personal position on the issues or experience that emerge in the text or to make personal or autobiographical admissions on stage unless they choose to. They're not pressured into enter, to enter into debates as a consequence of their writing, when that writing was not necessarily intended to fuel or embroil them in such debates. The literary text is quite likely to have been intended to be ambiguous, perhaps even to be rife with contradictions. So the experience of sharing these literary texts among this embodied reader audience creates a strong and palpable sense of shared emotion and bonding among participants through aspects like laughter, applause, silences, and other physical responses and reactions. The thinker John Dewey wrote way back in 1916 that there's more than a verbal tie between the words common, community, and communication. And at Polari, the performance of fiction really seems to tighten that knot. And the Polari Salon can also be seen as a meaningful emotional community. That concept was introduced by Max Weber in the early 20th century, and then developed by Michael Mefesely in the 1990s while looking at urban metropolitan tribes and the kinds of glue that can hold them together. So picking up that metaphor, Polari, the performance of literature can be seen as a glue, even a super glue, binding a slice of the LGBTQ plus community. So in all these ways, Polari functions as a nuanced, small scale, but powerful forum for political activism, for strengthening LGBTQ plus connection through community and for increasing recognition within mainstream culture. So it's a distinctly literary form of political activism. <laughs>
But Polari's value isn't solely about using literature for activist purposes. Vitally, on the other side of the coin, the Salon is fostering the creation of literature, the production and nurturing of more diverse, interesting and socially representative new writing that engages with LGBTQ plus experiences and that can function both through and beyond live literature events as a form of activism. So that brings me to the end of this talk. If you're interested in finding out more about it, uh, you might be interested in my book, which Sandra mentioned, where I talk about this research in more depth. And one of the chapters is focused on Polari. Um, and I also expand in a bit more depth about experiential literary ethnography as an approach to writing about arts-based experiences. So um, that book, Live Literature, should be uh, out later this year. So, and do feel free to ask uh, any questions at the end of this session, which does involve a QA, and a um, or to email at a later date. Um, so thanks very much for listening. And now it's time for me to hand over to Ben, whose excellent talk that you're about to hear has many resonances with mine, and I'm sure it will give you all a refreshing new perspective on contemporary author authorship and activism. So over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, uh, Ellen, and thank you too to Sandra and Ruth for overseeing this wonderful transformation of a conference into this ongoing debate over many weeks and months about this relationship between art and activism. And yeah, thank you too, Ellen, for your paper, which, as you said, I think links in so many ways to my own talk and my interest in the live literary event as a crucial node in the networks that authors use to construct and promote and indeed to stage their art, activism and political authorship. And it's in fact with a live literary event that I want to start my own paper today with as well. And I want to take everyone to the British Library in London. It's back in April 2017 and thus 10 months after the UK's referendum on its membership of the European Union. And writers, publishers, translators and the general public have gathered in London for the annual European Book Night. Inevitably, the subject on everyone's mind uh, was Brexit, although interestingly, there was little sign of collective mourning at this event. On the contrary, the evening was staged, indeed choreographed, as a moment of literary resistance, not least in the form of the Scottish author A.L. Kennedy's keynote speech. And I'm briefly going to bring up a PowerPoint with some quotes from that, but then return uh, to me. So um, in her speech, uh, Kennedy uh, essentially staked a claim for a renewed form of engaged authorship, which marked both a call for political action and for an existential commitment to both literature and Europe. And this is what she said. This Brexit is stupid. This is our loss. This is dangerous. We have to say this, we writers. We have to give up being embarrassed about what we do, apologising for thinking too much, understanding. Writers after Brexit will have this responsibility. So as I said, this is a rallying cry for engaged authorship, but also this bigger commitment to the power of writing and authors to change the world. Now, as Ellen just outlined in her paper, such events can be read within the commercial frameworks of authorship and the market as vehicles for book sales and publicity. But as Ellen also demonstrated, they are always much more than this, uh, particularly in the eyes of the audience. Indeed, they are places that enable and showcase authorial activism and provide these places for community and identification. And they're also places where we see many of the features of literary activism that were identified in last week's webinar too. So the webinar that Sandra spoke about on writers as political activists. Um, and in that webinar, which you can find online and, and watch, Simon Morgan, Divya Ayan, or Odile Heinders together outlined several key features of authorial activism. And I just want to um, quickly outline four of those things that I got out of that previous webinar, because I think it informs my approach to networks and authorship and activism too. So last week, we heard about how when authors become activists, there is always a need for visibility and performance. And I suppose that was largely about seeking out new opportunities to speak to both specialist, but also non-specialist audiences. 
We also heard a lot about the use of diverse genres. So using different forms and genres in a literary sense, but also different dissemination strategies beyond the literary work. We also heard about a complex set of balances, and one of those was between showcasing both direct intervention and fostering indirect debate when it came to political authorship. So that's balancing the use of literary authority to authorise, literally to advocate for a very specific cause, perhaps, you know, remaining in the European Union, or using that authority rather as a way of fostering debate and deliberation around a bigger issue, perhaps without necessarily coming down on one side or the other. And the final angle that came out of that conversation last week was also the relationship between deploying and strengthening of cultural authority. Essentially, there was a fine line between performing activism for genuinely political ends and a sense of performing activism to further enhance one's own cultural authority or even the authorial brand or celebrity. And essentially what I want to add to this discussion is the role of the network. Um, especially those networks that are formed when authors take the step towards becoming public intellectuals, a step that often involves these public performances of authorship, which links us back to Ellen's paper. These networks can take many forms. They can be both real world, but also virtual. They can be peer-to-peer, -peer, or they could also be, in fact, entirely imaginative, so they don't actually have to involve physical connections at all. Um, in turn, these networks involve nodes and actors, which can be both human and non-human. And here I'm loosely adopting the approach of Bruno Latour's actor network theory, which encourages us to think not just about the multiple individuals that form up networks, but also the multiplicity of institutions, locations, and other non-human elements, without which there cannot be this network. And to help with this, I want to very briefly look at uh, four authors. So alongside A.L. Kennedy, who I've already mentioned, a further Scottish author, Ali Smith, uh, and two Austrian authors, Katrin Regler and Robert Manasse. For all of these figures, the political fracture of Europe has led to new literary works, new literary networks and new extra literary roles in which they increasingly perform their engaged authorship and thus their engaged citizenship too. And so I first of all want to start with uh, Manasseh um, and actually with another live literary event, though in this case it's a political event rather than a literary one. In 2017, Manasseh was in Brussels, giving a speech to members of the European Parliament and Commission in honour of the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome. And Manasseh was in many respects a very obvious speaker because few other European authors have engaged as much with both the idea of Europe, but also the practicalities of the European institutions in their works. So just to briefly outline that, in 2012, Manasseh wrote a book-length political essay uh, called The European Courier on the future of the European Union, and that won uh, the prize for the best political book. And in 2017, he won the German Book Prize, so the major literary prize in the German-speaking countries, for The Capital, a novel set inside the European Commission and widely reviewed as the world's first ever EU novel. His speech to the European institutions would in turn be published as a critique of European reason, and he co-authored also a manifesto for the foundation of the European Republic with the political scientist and director of the European Democracy Lab, Ulrike Guerreau, which was published alongside that speech. Now I've started with this very brief account of Manasseh because he seems to me to represent the most obvious, the most traditional uh, iteration of the author as a public intellectual, one of those terms that Odile Heinders was really asking us to think about last week. And he reveals the way in which for an author to become this public intellectual, it requires the construction of different, and in Manasseh's case, frequently very elite networks. 
So these networks involve the collaboration and co-creation of materials with other figures. They involve the use of multiple forms and genres beyond the literary work. And they involve the active engagement with a network of extra literary institutions, which all come together to allow Manasseh to perform literary authorship in fields beyond literature, here obviously in the world of transnational politics. And I think what happens is that on the one hand, the network actually supports his transformation from author to public intellectual. But on the other hand, the network itself becomes a really visible manifestation of that political engagement and kind of takes on a layer of meaning above of what's actually in each of its individual nodes or each of its individual literary works. Now, Manasseh seems more than content to advocate for a political cause. And in his case, that's above all uh, a, call, a call for a post-national Europe and a European Republic. But other authors approach this transfer between poetics and politics with a little bit more skepticism. So the same year as Manasseh's speech to the commission, 2017, uh, A.L. Kennedy, who I started with, was again involved in a debate on the future of Europe and the role of literature in that. And she undertook a public discussion with the Austrian author. So here's the kind of transnational nature of a network, the Austrian author, Katrin Rögler. And this was part of a project called Fragile European Correspondence. So... If I just share my screen again, uh, there is the work. Now, Fragile uh, was a project that involved 14 pairs of authors from across Europe exchanging letters about, quote, what in Europe is so valuable that it must be protected, end quote. It thus marked a very specific iteration of a literary networking event, as illustrated uh, so clearly on its front cover and I'll just zoom in on that a little bit more, which both physically presents the network, so you can see here the locations of the authors, but also the locations of the network of literary houses of literature which supported and funded the event. Um, and I think it's interesting that this cover also somewhat nostalgically harks back to an earlier age, the age of airmail as a means of connectivity between uh, individuals. And that's particularly interesting because when you read their letters, these were actually primarily conducted by email and the uh, Fragile project also involved public lectures and readings. In turn, the project too didn't just end in the book, but had a very substantial and much more snazzy and interactive digital presence. And thus, I think it's an example of a sort of network that blurs the lines between the physical and the digital in bringing people together in modes of conversation and political activism. For Kennedy and uh, Rögler, uh, the access that they undertook in this network became the stage for the reflection, not uh, for a specific political stance, but for a reflection on the political role of the author and the political function of literature. And it was initially Kennedy that most clearly sensed an opportunity for her writing and political engagement to merge. And I think this is also a sign of Kennedy's already uh, well-established authorial network, where Kennedy performs her authorship across a range of physical and digital sectors. So on the one hand, she's obviously a fiction writer, she's also a journalist, but she also engages in perhaps what we might see as less elite forms. So she's very famously a stand-up comedian and a very active tweeter. And there is a collective impact of this physical and digital and authorial and non-literary network which cements but also performs her political engagement and that becomes in turn a crucial element of her authorial brand, perhaps even her authorial celebrity. It's Catherine Rögler who initially sees her writing and authorship in a more differentiated manner. So early on in their exchange, Rögler, for instance, notes with some irritation how at so-called literary events, she's constantly asked as an author about her political commitment, often being asked what is her commitment to, quote, work on a European story, end quote. And what might this have to do with literature? Rögler asks Kennedy with some frustration in one of her letters. <laughs> 
Above all, Vogler appears concerned that using literature for political advocacy might turn authors into what she terms, quote, contemporary reporters, rather than, I suppose, a critical or reflective practice on the nature of language and discourse. And here, it's really important that I stress that this does not mean that Vogler is lacking in political commitment. I know she's not widely translated into English, so I, I want to make clear that she is a highly politically engaged author. But rather, I think what her scepticism revolves around is the demand for speed and simplicity that can be placed on political writing or when authors engage in direct political advocacy. I think she sees writing and language as tools of political complication rather than political resolution. And as my colleague at King's Anya McMurtry has really helpfully argued, Kregler's work, quote, insists on the potential of fiction to offer more complex alternatives to ideology and dialectical modes of resolution." End quote. Elsewhere, Rögler has reflected on the challenge this poses her as an individual uh, and how authors might still nevertheless find ways to intervene into the actual or real world. Uh, so in some of her poetological essays she notes, and this is a translation again by McMurtry, there's a whole world out there. It's damn real and responsible for some of our most pleasant and unpleasant experiences. I can't simply tuck it away in forms of discourse. I need to look it out, engage with it. How Rögler achieves this and how we might map that as kind of cultural studies scholars is currently the subject of a project that I'm working on with my colleague Lizzie Stewart and with an undergraduate research fellow we're mentoring, uh, Benny Atanasov. And rather than undertaking close readings of Vogler's works, which is what I'm trained to do as a literary scholar, uh, together with Benny, uh, well, Benny's really doing the work, he's spending this month creating a database of the institutions and individuals that Vogler has been engaging with. Using that thus to map the network she has created and the political issues she has been advocating for within it. I think as of 5 p.m. last night, Benny has mapped at least 195 events. And while some of these are clearly the more traditional live literary events, which both Ellen and I were talking about as part of the economy of the book market, it's also abundantly clear how Rögler is also creating and situating herself within a literary political network that allows her to deploy her authorial capital directly as a political activist. And what's interesting in tracking that over a kind of a 10 year period, it appears that this has increased when she took on another role. She became the vice president of the Academy of Arts in Berlin. And this was a role in which she became even more visible as an actor within the European cultural scene. This position is, in fact, precisely an example of the extra literary or institutional role that Edward Said tells us is essential for any author's transformation from writer to public intellectual. And interestingly, too, it's through that role at the Academy that Regler has subsequently undertaken further artistic collaborations with Kennedy, so cementing their kind of bilateral network, but expanding that to include other artists, composers, scenographers, to create not just the space for a debate on what politically engaged authorship might be, but one for co-creating new forms of politically engaged art. So the network becomes generative for new collaborations. Vogler's concern that the political engagement of literature might transform authors into contemporary reporters brings me to my concluding and very short final case study, uh, that of Ali Smith and her seasonal quartet. This series of four novels, the final one, uh, Summer, is due out in three weeks time, was originally reviewed as a response to the EU referendum, which I opened with, with Autumn, the first in the sequence, celebrated as the first great Brexit novel. Critics have repeatedly focused on the reactive nature of Smith's project. So Annick Preston, uh, quote, marveled that writing this good could have come this fast. I think thus hinting that speed often is seen as not often resulting in quality. While Olivia Lang, I think, has very interestingly suggested that, quote, maybe an accelerated news cycle requires accelerated art, end quote. <laughs> 
Such explicitly reactive writing by Smith would seem to perhaps place her close to the role of contemporary reporter, that role that so concerned Rögler. Yet despite the uh, political immediacy of these novels and Smith's own highly visible intervention into the Brexit debate through them, I don't think her project can be conceived as one as simply literary reporting or reportage. For one thing, Smith's political targets ultimately expand far beyond Brexit and also include the refugee crisis, the legacies of fascism, the banking and pensions crisis, climate change, gentrification, economic austerity, the election of Donald Trump, many other events, which are then in turn historicized by extensive explorations of older political crises. So for example, the perfumer affair in autumn or the Greenham column protests in winter. And so this are both a, a transperiod and a transnational contextualization of Brexit, which moves us far beyond simply a kind of local reactive response. But the reason I want to conclude with Smith's project is that it's also home to a form of literary network, unlike the others that I've addressed so far today. So it's not a network that's either physical through the live literary event or digital, but it's affiliative and imaginative, creating connections to an extraordinarily diverse cast of authors and artists. So figures such as Dickens and Shakespeare loom very large through these novels and form perhaps a more traditional network of intertextual references. But there are multiple further connections to authors from across Europe, from classical antiquity through to the present day. And I think even more importantly, Smith crosses genre and connects with the visual arts too, above all to Pauline Botti, Barbara Hepworth and Tacita Dean. And work by these artists is included in the books, not least in the end pages, so it's literally woven into the project. And Smith, I think, almost goes so far as to present these visual artists as co-creators of her fictional response. Of course, we might read such networks as less concerned with politics and rather as an elite intellectual game concerned above all with showcasing Smith's own cultural knowledge and authority, and thus also reinforcing that of the reader, you know, ha ha, I'm so clever, I can spot that that's a reference to Plato or whatever. But this seems to me a deeply unfair assessment of Smith's project, because her insistence on sharing space with these other authors seems to me to be an act of generosity and thus a political act, common to all the European artists she brings into her imaginative network is that their lives or work tell further stories of displacement and loss. This moved Smith's own political intervention beyond a single issue, the contemporary concern with Brexit, and indeed recasts Brexit in different times, different medias and different voices. It's an affiliative network which ultimately creates an almost dialogic form which generates a depth and slowness to these novels which belies the reactive speed with which they are written and any sense that her political engagement should be seen solely as a form of contemporary reportage. Instead, her politics is thus performed across time and space through an imaginative artistic network. So a 30 second conclusion and then I'll be quiet. All the authors I've considered in this paper have explored how they might use their cultural capital to draw attention to social and political issues, but also instigate change. Some very comfortably move between different nodes in the networks. Some come from positions of extreme privilege like Manasseh. Some advocate very clearly for specific causes. Others like Smith and Rögler use their networks to perform a more complicated debate on the very question of the relationship between art and activism. But whether establishing connections with institutions beyond the literary world, whether co-creating with other authors and artists, or whether establishing more transtemporal and transnational networks of affiliation, there is thus a constant invocation of the network, both as the engine of, but also for the stage for performances of political authorship that use the arts to explore and thus shape the future of Europe. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'll now hand back to Sandra and look forward to questions and debate with uh, Ellen and you all. Thank you so much, Ben, and thank you, Ellen, for two absolutely wonderful papers. I mean, um, 
they must have triggered so many questions and for my part I don't even know where to start and uh, since Ruth can't ask questions as a panelist I got my whatsapp buzzing here with stuff that's coming from her but of course I'm going to be shamelessly exploiting uh, uh, my privilege as a chair to kind of get us going because I think your two papers have absolutely wonderfully covered this triangular relationship between authors institutions networks and audiences so i think it's, it's it's very crucial that we also got the kind of audience perspective that has come in here and um, what i think was also very striking apart from showing yeah, and reminding us of the status of literature and literary performance as forms of activism in their own right what i think has also come out very clearly is how the literary work and this extra literary performance of the author as activist how they condition each other and how they relate to one another and that these are blurred boundaries you know that you can't really sort of prize apart yeah? so I thought that was that was absolutely wonderful um, now can I just sort of you know ask the inevitable and I suppose this gets us back to this kind of reactive response of, of the author now we obviously live in times where disturbing news keep rolling in thick and fast and um, where Brexit and things like the crisis of Europe debate have uh, been replaced in the media headlines, I guess, by COVID or even got conflated, I think, in a, in a very problematic manner. So how have those authors that you've been talking about or institutions or eventually like Polari, how have they reacted to this new state of emergency that the world's been thrown into? And which of course has so dramatically affected the arts world and the arts industry. And of course, I'm thinking of this absence of liveness, which as Ellen has pointed out, is so crucial to those constructions of identity and, and community. Can you just perhaps- Yeah, well, I've obviously had to, to think about that. Apologies for the, for the knocking um, this time behind me. I think I've got a child wanting to attract my attention. Um, but yes, I mean, it's, you know, the COVID-19 has had this profound effect on all forms of, of live embodied performance and live literature among among other forms um, and so many events have had to be cancelled this year and perhaps indefinitely cancelled and you know it's hugely affected artists and producers and in really dramatic ways and it's hard it's hard to know how the landscape will reform itself you know as and when this this changes um, but quite a lot of events um, have um, adapted to you know as, as you have Sandra with this with this conference to offer online alternatives so it's interesting to to see the extent to which this will actually open up access to audiences in different places who wouldn't otherwise be able to come and perhaps fertilize more debates about you know all these issues um, with with broader audiences that then once the live events start again um, perhaps will feel you know new conversations and interactions and I suspect that a lot of live events will start to offer streaming as a more um, as a more common element of events to, to bring in more people and you know in, in my research I've, I've focused on and drawn on some neuroscientific evidence to look at how the live experience of being in a physical space with an embodied audience really does shape people's responses you know, experiences of value through all these emotional connections um, but and, you know, and that experience really can't be replicated exactly online but a lot of a lot of the value of live events can still um, a lot of the ideas can still be shared communications connections can still be made um, so hopefully um, you know not too many producers you know events will be will be permanently dashed but will be able to reform and 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 create new conversations in future. And I think in that kind of context, Smith is really interesting because she was due to speak at the Hay Festival, which then obviously had to become digital. And then she refused to do a kind of traditional uh, uh, live literary event, but in a kind of online form. Instead, she then collaborated with another visual artist and produced a short movie, uh, kind of a short film of 15 minutes, which was then screened. Uh, but not captured on the Hey Player, so the kind of digital platform. So she was attempting, I think, to, to preserve in an era in which we're recording all our live events for posterity, something of the ephemerality of the live event. And there was something about that 
process of kind of anxiously trying to log on and hoping that the bandwidth of the Hay Festival's website would allow all the people to watch it simultaneously. Um, and knowing that if you didn't get in, that was it because it wasn't going to be recorded, that did change the kind of response. And it was very interesting to watch the kind of the chat function on the side of the Hay player. It was a deeply um, emotional and actually effective performance. It was a, a screening of Smith just narrating uh, a story about, it was about COVID, so it was meant to be about uh, uh, summer, the novel, and thus supposedly about Brexit. But as you said, Sandra, these issues have kind of morphed, transformed, merged. And it was a meditation, a linguistic meditation on the one hand, so classic Smith on, on what it means to kind of touch hands, which of course we're no longer allowed to do. We must, at the very most bump elbows, but we shouldn't really be doing that too because we can't be two meters apart in doing that. And what this means for kind of human interaction. And honestly, by the end, I was weeping <laughs> um, and couldn't quite, couldn't quite believe that I was having this emotional response to this screening. But at the same time, you couldn't see Smith at all. You could hear her voice, but what she was showing was clips from movies through, uh, including you know, from Hitchcock through to many other, many other sources of these moments of connection that we can no longer have. Mm. Um, so there was an immediacy to her response, but it both brought together two different things. It brought together something of the visual of the media that we can have over, uh, over this online form. It took away the focus on her as an embodied author and instead put uh, collaboration, so another form of network in the in the forefront. And I'm quite sure that when we get uh, summer in three weeks time, COVID will, well, I probably will eat my words now, but I'm going to say, my, I think everyone is predicting that summer will obviously deal very extensively in refracted ways though, not in direct ways, with the, with the COVID crisis, because that's what she does. She spends the two or three months prior to the publication date writing. Um, and it's only because her publisher has developed a means of disseminating and printing the book so quickly that they can be responsive um, in that way. And I think that's also quite interesting and important in terms of the networks is that, you know, the physical ability to, to turn books around that quickly, which is, as we all know, particularly in academic publishing, can take years, <laughs> you know, but this has been compressed down into a really speedy process of proofreading, editing and production and, dissemin and dissemination um, is the only thing that allows her writing to also uh, take on this reactive, uh, reactive form in a, in a traditional print media. Because in this particular case, I mean, there is a need, you know, I mean, to address a momentous event like this one, you know, which affects people globally. Yeah. And I'm thinking of, I mean, how authors make use of their roles. Yeah. I mean, their cultural roles as, as prophetic sages in a way, yeah, to make those interventions in the public discourse. Yeah. And, and I mean, whether it is, as you, as you said, uh, someone like A.L. Kennedy um, now entering really deeply into the whole mask debate on, on Twitter, or someone like Benjamin Zephaniah speaking out about the forgotten victims of the corona crisis. Yeah? So, I mean, they do make use yeah, of those channels and those platforms yeah, in order to um, take up that role, yeah, which is also a kind of cultural role and an expectation yeah, that we also seem to have in terms of writers. And that's what distinguishes them, I suppose, from other celebrities yeah, and people from the entertainment industries, yeah, sort of also making those public interventions, but um, drawing quite a different audience reaction, I would think. Yeah. Right, I think it's probably time to take a few questions that have come in here. Well, there is one from my colleague, Julia, which is for Ellen specifically. And uh, it says here, uh, Ellen, I really enjoyed the samples of your experiential literary ethnography how evocative and ultimately how useful to convey some of the atmosphere and context of a live literature performance. And um, she's definitely one who's gonna be uh, getting hold of your book. So she was wondering um, whether you have ever attempted to engage with historical events via audio or video recordings and to what extent your method or part of it might be transferable to the study of past events in which you did not take part yourself. Well, thanks so much for that question. Um, 
And thanks for your kind words. Yeah, um, it's really interesting. Quite, both questions are interesting. In relation to the uh, engaging with historical events, I think that's a fascinating challenge. You know, research about audiences in theatre history, for example, is really um, blooming right now. And it's a, it's a very popular subject matter. But it, I don't, to my knowledge, it hasn't really been explored in a literary context. So I think there's certainly scope there for that. And, um, you know, but uh, the theatre research context has revealed that you know, you can find a lot of, about um, audience experience through archival research. And in a literary context, you know, there are narratives about Dickens's performances, for example, you know, about how audiences would faint and have all these really dramatic reactions, and how even Dickens was perhaps uh, uh, so, you know, got so overworked and overexcited by his performances that it led to his early death. So, you know, there are a lot of, um, that's perhaps an extreme example, but I think there is a lot of potential for that. And in terms of the ethnographic mm -hmm. element of um, speaking informally with, with reader audiences, which was a key part of my research, Obviously, that's not possible, but yeah, it might be somewhere where you know more literary imagination can be involved and th thinking about how to communicate, how to imagine from the archival archival research is there, how that might have translated to more individual, um, you know, personal, emotional experiences, and drawing some links between you know what we know and what what we um, what we suspect might be true, and exploring that that boundary could be really interesting. Um, as we as for engaging via audio and video. Yeah, I mean, there's again, there's plenty of fuel for that. I um, like Ben. I, I, because um, one of my chapters in the book is about the Hay Festival, so I researched that at some length. So I was really interested to see this year how the um, digital version would go. Um, and you know, it was it was it was really great to be able to experience it and you know, fascinating potential, um, which I'll probably write about at some point in terms of how the the audience interaction compared to to the real embodied event. I think for this this book and this this piece of research I was really focused and interested on the particular quality of um, embodied live events and physical spaces and you know it's it, in a way with the book coming out it's a, it, it's a peculiar time for that to be happen, happening but it's also quite an opportune time in the sense that you know for actually focusing on why we do value these live embodied experiences why they are different to the to the screen-based experiences that we're all becoming so familiar with is is interesting but yeah there's absolutely a huge field of research on what the impact of more digital um, connections are using those recordings um, and certainly in my research if anyone's interested in the hay festival they've got this hay player with all, all their events from years back um available online which will you know very interesting rich resource well, wonderful. I mean, talking about sort of the historical perspective, uh, do you want to come in on this, Ben? And uh, I mean, obviously the examples that you've talked about are, you know, ultra contemporary, but then you have an interest in the 19th century. No, I'm really a 19th centuryist. So of course, as soon as this happened, I mean, it was exactly what immediately came to, to mind was the example that obviously Ellen also invoked too. So these exceptional kind of accounts of the Dicken of Dickens's readings, and then this kind of mythology that then builds up on the kind of the taxing nature of the literary reading for the author to, to the extent that Dickens, um, Dickens dies as a result of too exaggerated a uh, performance. And literally there, I think, a performance that isn't simply a reading, but this kind of these accounts of his embodiment of the of, of, of the characters. And I think there is a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting work uh, around that. And perhaps also some questions around um, what happens when we think back? I mean, there's some really interesting work on kind of voice and 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 dead authors and how we kind of recover elements of of, of how they sounded and, and how they spoke. Or, you know, I, I work in a building called the Virginia Woolf building, and then there's this one little bit of recording of Virginia Woolf speaking, in which she kind of has a very different uh, accent to how I've always imagined this person speaking to me in the text. And I think that that's an interesting link back to one of the things that Ellen was talking about, about how when you are exposed to authorial readings you can then transpose that voice into your reading and this relationship between the voices that we get as a kind of experience uh, as a reader of a text and then how this changes once we have that experience of the, of the actual embodied voice of the author and, and what additional kind of changes that has. Um, uh, in particular there are moments in 
in Smith's work, where it's very tempting to read it as direct address from, from her, uh, quite clearly not always, but there are these moments where it then goes into kind of almost a, a form of, of kind of concrete poetry. Um, and I always hear Smith's voice there, but I'm also aware that this is my imaginative investment. And I, so I think what happens in all these cases, it's the place of the kind of an imaginative investment either backwards into previous periods, or indeed with, with authors that are alive and kicking. Um, and we very rarely actually have that direct experience. Um, so there's also, uh, to, to, to hear the author's voice, despite the plethora of these activities, there's also an elite element to these, 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 these programs. Certainly in, in, in my project, obviously, these, these are elite networks. I mean, what, so what I found really fascinating about uh, Ellen's work was the kind of the, the distinction between something like Hay um, and then what's happening with uh, with Polari and the kind of and the and, and the salon structure, which is both at once smaller, but also uh, seems more directly engaged in kind of acts of community building, as well as um, as well as say you know with 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 a large network uh, kind of trying to put toward put across either authorial capital or a political stance. Mm -hmm. A very important point and uh, perhaps can I just ask both of you because that's also something that has come up last time in some of the discussions you know what kind of role does the market play in all of this when it comes to those political author postures and the way in which they are constructed I mean can we entirely sort of disregard the market and its demands and especially when, when, we, when we think of a, a literary festival like Hay I mean, that's, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to say all about, yeah, but certainly um, an important component of that is about marketing the author and marketing the work. Yeah? And the two kind of conflate in very interesting and sometimes even problematic ways. So yes, I mean, Hay is an example of, you know, this kind of really mainstream literary festival, which is structurally really interconnected with the with the publishing industry. I mean, the, the authors that get staged at Hay are either the, you know, the big name, well-known authors, or if, to the extent that debut authors are staged, they are usually the ones who have had the big advances from their publishers and they're being pushed this year. And, they, you know, it's a very small selection of them get, that get put on a Hay stage. So it's sort of regarded as the kind of elite pinnacle of of, um, of literary culture in that sense. And what why I would what was interested to juxtapose Hay with Polari is because Polari is seeking to do the opposite. It's seeking to provide a space that's counter to mainstream literary culture that and but also that doesn't just um, seek to stage you know the the high profile well known writers, but explicitly integral to the structure of it is to provide a stage for emerging writers for emerging work that's still in progress. So um, I think the live literature scene has developed to incorporate you know, both ends of that spectrum in a really interesting way. And both of them have, um, have, have real value. I mean, it, you know, it is an incredible experience to be able to go to Hay and walk around and, you know, all these brilliant authors and fascinating books, and you can get this sort of very direct experience of it. And I, you know, although the publishers, it's very important to them as a, as a marketing exercise and often that's how Hay is seen and there have been a lot of critiques about of Hay as just being you know it's just become a forum for celebrity and you know everyone who goes to it just wants to say they've seen this famous person and there might be an element of that but also you know audience audiences I spoke to um you know like at Polari had very often very meaningful significant experiences for them that again often really shaped the way in which they responded to texts and they certainly weren't going there just as a means of sort of encountering celebrity, although that is um, a real part of it. That's something you'd like to comment on, Ben. Well, I mean, I, I suppose the in many ways the the networks that I kind of look at are more are more intangible, um, in as much as they don't simply revolve around a festival like that, which obviously has a commercial as well as an artistic impetus. But that 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 multiplicity is is always there. Um, and um, I mean, I think certainly some of my figures engage with that more creatively and some of them just engage with it more directly. And that it is also about this notion of kind of the, the authorial capital that Odile um, Hainders was also talking about, about last week. And it's not entirely clear where political engagement ends and, um, and, um, and self-promotion begins. And 
this isn't necessarily a problem. Um, <laughs> they don't have to be mutually exclusive concepts. But someone like Manasseh, I think, you know, uh, in, in an Austrian context, you know, very much known as the kind of a moral conscience of the of the nation, or has tried for years to, well, has, has developed a kind of critical stance against a, a very a comparatively local European story. Um, um, and in a very important one in kind of engaging Austria with uh, the legacies of uh, the Second World War and elements of complicity, of course, but now seems very directly attempting to expand his network to one that is pan-European and in that also shift his status from being the moral conscience of, of Austria to being the moral conscience of Europe and that obviously then involves a great deal of self-promotion involves then a whole lot of other people in the networks in particular translators in this case and marketing and and so all the apparatus of the of the publishing industry which on the one hand is yes trying to sell copies of the books in multiple translations to multiple markets but on the other hand is also something that he is then deploying to secure greater capital for his own authorial brand but then if you agree with his political stance is also his way of suggesting that the structures of the European Union do need reform. And he is then able to take that because he develops all that power and capital right to those politicians. Um, but that is still quite a, a hermetically sealed world. And what it doesn't include then is precisely the grassroots activists, the work all across the European Union, which is being done by people in so many other contexts that never gets the oxygen in order to be able to go to the commission and, and state those positions. And so it's, it's, there's a, there, is a, there is a kind of an ethical quandary also around kind of mapping, uh, mapping these, uh, these networks because they also are self-fulfilling. Um, so uh, it's quite easy when I talk about this project and the way that I approach it. And if you use Latour to kind of think, oh, great, you've mapped this very diverse selection of people from across countries and even across time periods. Um, but of course, any act of co-creation can be an act of diversification. And I think that that is what's happening in Smith and to an extent with Kennedy, too, actually. Mm -hmm. But in other cases, it can simply reinforce dominant structural narratives. And so uh, wider networks don't necessarily lead to a wider polarity of voices, which is, again, why I was so fascinated by, by Ellen's kind of approach and this, this contrast in her book between some of the large scale and, well, yeah, it's issues of scale that kind of and, and community that come up with these with these networking and live literary events and who has access and platform mm -hmm. and visibility. Exactly. It's, it's the co-creation that's the kind of catch word there. Um, right. I'm kind of mindful that we're running out of time, but uh, there's one more question here, which has been kind of asked twice. And so I think perhaps you could try and answer that in just one sentence, both of you. And I think the, the question really is, what inspired your current project? In Evan's case, what inspired your book? And in Ben's case, what's inspired this, this project of working on literary political networks of writers? Yes, thanks. Well, yeah, I mean, the way this, this question is phrased in relation to mine, I mean, um, suggested that there's some, some some bravery in writing about the the LGBTQ plus you know elements that I've talked about. I mean, in the UK, I think this question has come from somebody who's in India. So you know, thanks so much for participating in an event in the UK. It's great. Um, obviously, I think it's just a bit different in the UK. Homosexuality is legal and widely accepted. So writing just doesn't entail the sort of bravery in the same way as it might do elsewhere in the world. But I wanted to write about Polari particularly because of the distinct ways in which the salon really worked in comparison to other literary events and how it how it affects a, a, to its participants and forges and binds this particular community and um, you know the historic pattern of social discrimination against people who identify as LGBTQ plus might have reduced in the UK but it hasn't gone away still and so this makes Polari in particular continue to be really valuable and really interesting to a researcher like me who's interested in the cultural value of literature and the notion of literary activism. Um, yeah, and I suppose just more broadly, my, my interest in live literature and my inspiration for that just, just comes to, you know, an interested anthropological interest and interest as a writer in literary culture and, and, and how it works. It's something, as I said, hasn't really been much written about, but, you know, I have a background in um, 
as, a, as Sandra mentioned, as, as a barrister, as a musician, I have a background in performance and I'm really interested in that and interested in the way that literature can be understood and appreciated not just as a text on the page but as something that is actually performed and spoken and is a form, always a form of performance and conversation in some way. So that was my sort of spark for the wider project. It's a, it's a really good question. Why do we do, why do we do what we do? I think for me, I mean, I mean, I, I was, this is part, this is partly a response to thinking about Brexit and also the role of the academy in thinking through the consequences of this. I work in the German studies department. I am a modern linguist. I have dedicated my life to speaking multiple languages. I am of the so-called Erasmus generation that has benefited uh, from all of these. I remember a period before uh, the Lisbon Treaty, before I became a citizen of the European Union, and now I'm going to experience a period after that. And I was intrigued, but what, what, what happens when you're confronted and what happens to authors when they're confronted with with things that kind of fundamentally change uh, their status and relationships. And I wanted to model that. Um, so there was a kind of an ethical concern and I was interested in, in, how to, in how to engage with this. I'd already been personally heavily involved in various projects about narratives of European unionists, <laughs> unionists, so um, uh, as, a, as an academic. So I've been working with the Commission uh, on various uh, projects about new narratives for the European future. Um, as an English, uh, as an English citizen who was about not to be a European citizen, and I was intrigued to see what also happened elsewhere. Uh, I was also working extensively on theatre and performance and precisely questions of liveness and what happens uh, to audiences and this seemed a way to kind of bring bring those two concerns together and I think to an extent it was that moment of sitting in the British Library uh, and 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 Kennedy's call to arms uh, which was uh, was an electrifying moment and I thought what's going on here um, and I was very lucky that I had the uh, the, the ability to to take that interest and, and start to map it in a series of bigger projects. And as you said, working with you and other colleagues through Rebecca Brown's project up in Lancaster about author world authorship was central for thinking about how lev authors leverage their cultural capital. And that brings that linked my interest in theatre and performance suddenly with an interest in, in Europe. So it's always quite serendipitous in some ways. Uh, um, and you you pursue these things that seem to matter. Exactly. And so it's also about the responsibility of the scholar. Mm. And so that nicely sort of, you know, ties things up with the responsibility of the author, which we've been talking about. And I think this is probably a good and also a kind of somewhat hopeful note on which to end. And I really do wish, I mean, I could say, let's continue our conversation in a more informal setting. And the hope is really that this is something that we'll be able to do once more in the not too distant future, as I guess, you know, that's really one of the things that we regret most about not being able to congregate in person. So again, there's, there are things about live which obviously cannot be replicated and um, which of course is a sad thing for now but hopefully that's something that will change in the future. But anyway our sincere thanks go to both Ellen and Ben for joining us here today for delivering two absolutely brilliant papers uh, in incredible in their riches and we could continue talking about uh, the various points that you've raised for, for hours. Um, and, and they've given rise to uh, a, a really wonderful conversation. So thanks so much to both of you for taking the time. I would also like to say a big thank you once more to uh, the lovely Jamie Toya, who's been tirelessly working behind the scenes to make sure uh, that there's a smooth running of our events. Also our conference partners at Torch, their fabulous team and the FAF Austrian Science Fund, the Austrian Centre for Life Writing, Postcolonial Writers Make Worlds, and the Stephen Spender Trust for their continued support. Now, Art in Action will take a bit of a summer break now, but we'll hopefully see you again in five weeks' time when we continue our series with an exciting event dedicated to female authorship and activism in the long 19th century. So we're back to the kind of historical uh, uh, realms here. And do please join us again then on Friday, the 21st of August, all the details available online and the info is also coming here through the chat. So if you already know that you're going to attend this event, just click straight on that link. 
In the meantime, uh, check out our Art in Action website, our project page of Torch, and our social media channels for regular updates. We might be taking a bit of a break from running Zoom webinars, but we'll keep sharing a variety of inspiring content with you, such as some exciting material specifically produced for Art in Action by the acclaimed author Kirsty Garman. So do stay tuned and watch this space. For now, this just leaves us to wish you a relaxing and enjoyable summer. So hopefully stay well and stay safe wherever you are and um, very much looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.